Let the speak. Episode 54. Hootin', hollerin', hollerin', hootin'. Do you kick ass when you speak, present, or pitch? If not, these expert discussions and insider tips can help you right now, today. Welcome to the What the Speak podcast. I'm your host, Brian Kelly. Um. <laughs> what, 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 what? Research in 2009 by Pablo Bernal revealed that by simply taking a posture of confidence, people feel more confident. Now there's a device that can help you with this. It's called LumoLift, and I've already pre-ordered mine. If you'd like to boost your confidence when speaking in public through better posture, check out whatthespeak.com slash lift to watch the video and grab one for yourself. Rick Altman, are you ready to answer the question, what the speak? What the heck? I'm ready. (laughs) Love it. Well, Rick, I know that you are a consultant, a speaker, an author, a presentation design ninja, we'll call it. I've never been called that before. (laughs) You're also the man behind the Presentation Summit, which is an annual gathering of about 200 or so people who really want to get better at presentation design. And uh, I thank you for coming on the show. Looking forward to talking about your story. My pleasure. Thanks for having me, Brian. So I'm pretty sure that you specifically talk about presentation design because I remember the first time that I saw you, I, you were given a presentation. It was called, why I think it was something like, Why Most PowerPoint Presentations Suck. And it was awesome. You started out, you got the introduction from the host and, and you, you went something like, you know, thank you everybody for being here today. I'm, I'm really excited to be here. Uh, as you can see, we've got a lot of content to cover. Oh, I it may look boring, but I promise you it's very exciting. Now I'm going to take the next 10 minutes to tell you a little bit about myself in my business. I intentionally committed death by PowerPoint in front of us. Yes. And that was the first impression that they had of me. It was awesome. I thought I was sitting there going, oh, dear God. Like I, 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 bought, I bought it hook, line, and sinker, Rick. It was you know, I, I absolutely brilliant. That. I'm never more nervous than when I, when I do that little intro because I'm intentionally <laughs> not being myself. And that's like the first thing that we, that we tell our clients and our audience is that you have to be genuine. So here I am spending the first 45 seconds trying to be as bad as possible. So yeah, that, that's, that's among the most nerve-wracking of all the times I ever spent in front of an audience. <laughs> That's hilarious. Yeah, I, I think it's awesome. I, it was such a twist mm. to where then you're like, who gives a crap about this? This is so boring. Yeah, <laughs> but yet this is, this is what we see when, when most of us who work in any type of field, mm-hmm. whether it's business, science, uh, the medical profession, like whenever we're in an environment where somebody has to get up and share their knowledge, mm. it becomes this information dump. That's right. That's right. It, and people might as well, you know, save your time. Here's a, a Word document that's a report that shows, you know, is going to give you exactly everything that I want to share you. And we can all save the afternoon. Yeah, just email it to me, please. Yep. Yeah. You know, and the, and the, the funny thing, to go back to that, that opening for a second, people are so accustomed to being bored and annoyed in presentations that, that when, when I do that, that opening, I then ask people, well, how many, how many of you didn't even notice how bad the first 30 seconds were because, because they're so used to it? You know, that's, that's the ironic and almost the, tra- the tragic part of this. It's just, become, it's just become standard operating procedure to, uh, to, to go into a, a, a presentation of any sort or a webinar and just expect to be bored. Yeah. <laughs> Pretty sad. Uh, it, it is really sad because <laughs> it doesn't. Honestly, I mean, it doesn't take much other than some thoughtfulness to preparing your material and injecting a little bit of your personality and who you are into this. And then also, you know, some of the tricks that I think uh, we'll dive into later that you'll share that you you teach a lot of people on how to visually make a presentation, you know, with just little tweaks and changes, really visually compelling. That's right. It and you don't have to much. be a graphic designer. You're right. It doesn't take much to distinguish yourself from about 99% of everybody giving presentations today. Yeah. Yeah. 
So Rick, let's talk a little bit about your your story, your background. You know, how did you get into this whole crazy world of presentation design? Uh, where did it all start for you? Well, how far should I go? Um, I wasn't a good enough tennis player to make it onto the tour. <laughs> um, all of this is Plan B. Uh, there you go. Yeah, and no, I, I was uh, I was a, a journalist, a sports journalist coming out of school, and um, I mean, this is like what you know, 1910 or so, when when desktop publishing was just starting to get invented. I was the editor of, a, of Inside Tennis magazine, and I had this uh, this old computer. It wasn't even a, 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 a PC. It was a, it was an Osborne computer. It looked like a suitcase. Wow. Uh, that was 1910, I think. Yeah, I know. I mean, it was it was the early 1980s. And, um, but we learned that we could, um, put like little codes into our, okay, you ready for this? Our word star files. Oh, and, wow. uh, and then we could send it off to our typesetters and they wouldn't have to retype it. It was incredible. We were using like a 300 baud modem that cost $800, but this was just, this was earth shaking to not have wow. to retype articles. And, um, this, this was just so compelling that, that I, I, I quit and I became a, desktop publishing consultant, but it was before the phrase was even invented. John Warnock had not yet said, let there be desktop publishing. So it was just a, it was just a very heady time back then. Um, and from there into graphics and uh, all the Corel products that came out of Canada before Adobe stomped them. They were the darlings of the, of the, of the, 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 um, the windows based graphic industry. Yeah. And, um, and then that universe shrunk and, and a friend of mine said, well, you really should be doing this for PowerPoint. And I said, nah, who cares about PowerPoint? He says, no, everybody, you know, then they all suck at it too. You should be doing <laughs> PowerPoint. And I, he just kept, he just kept badgering me. And so finally I, I said, okay, fine. I'll, I'll put my money where your mouth is. Let's do it. And, uh, we hosted the presentation summit back in 2003. The first time 180 people showed up, we weren't wow. sure if we'd get 25. <laughs> and, so, and, uh, and now we're in our, uh, what a, a 12th season. Yeah. So like what, how, have you been able to to draw on this thing where most people look at PowerPoint as this utilitarian tool right. that they have to use, and you know they've been given a template to work with, or they open up the software and use yeah. the template that's in there? Yeah. Um, you know, how have you been able to cultivate this community of people that really want to get better at this? Like yeah. they've they they wake up in the morning and they say, "How can I design a more compelling?" Yeah. Well, you know, they they owe their livelihoods to this in, in most cases. But, um, you know, Brian, really the irony of all of this is that the problem is not that the software is so difficult. The problem is that it's too easy. I I think it's the easiest program in the office suite to to start using. Both of my daughters created slides when they were, what, 10 years old in fourth Mm -hmm. grade or something. So, you know, unlike, um, you know, like Adobe Photoshop, you know, people know that program's hard. They know they have to go buy books and go, you know, go to webinars and, and conferences and everything else. But PowerPoint, it's not the case. You can start creating slides in the, in the, in, in the first hour or so. And, um, and that's the problem. <laughs> the problem is that nobody goes beyond the, that very limited skill set that they developed in one hour <laughs> of training. And then they go on to use the software for the next five, ten years doing that same little thing. You know, we took, we took a poll one year at the conference. We asked people how much time they spent learning the software. So these are 200 of the most vested people that you'll ever find in the industry because they took three or four days out of their life, flew from all over the country, even the world, yeah. to come to the conference. Just about everybody said less than an hour. And a few people said 15 minutes they spent 15 minutes learning powerpoint before they (laughs) declared themselves proficient so that's the first problem is that people don't spend enough time with the software Uh, now if that were the only issue that this would be solvable but you know you can become a an expert at powerpoint brian you could become a powerpoint god and it would not in any way guarantee that you can craft a compelling message, provide visuals that complement the message, and deliver it with impact. So, I mean, the software does not in any way uh, p- provide you with the tools to do those things, and those are much harder. Those really are hard. <laughs> so, you know, and you couple all of that with the fact that uh, people are scared to death, to, you know, to speak in public. What did Jerry Seinfeld say? The person would rather be in the casket than delivering the eulogy. Yep, so yeah. you take all this together, and you've got you, you've got um, something that's that's hard to do. 
Well, it's such a good point that you make because you can master the software and you can understand, you know, all the different things that you can do at this, you know, at the service, it is a very easy piece of software, Mm -hmm. you know, to use, but there's a lot that you can do with it that most people only scratch the surface with. And of course it's evolved over the years and gotten more, more advanced. And then, um, yeah, but people don't know it because it's like you said, yeah, it it, it doesn't take much to make people's heads explode with what Mm -hmm. you do with PowerPoint because they, but there's so much more to it. That's right. There's crafting a, a message and, um, you know, picking visuals that really underscore what it is that you're talking about and, and realizing that it's a tool to support what your message is versus something that it is your message. And that's, that's the pitfall that I think a lot of folks fall into is it becomes a crutch that you say, okay, well, here's my presentation. I didn't practice it. I don't, you know, if, you, <laughs> if, if the sh- machine shut down, and yeah. my hard drive be you know, blew up. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I don't know what I'm going to talk about now. Yeah, yeah. Because <laughs> all my bullets are there. Yeah, in, in, in very few other walks of life do we, do we expect to be able to achieve success just by winging it. And yet that, that people do that all the time with yep. PowerPoint. It's right. It's the ultimate crutch. And uh, there, 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 are, there are many reasons for that, m- many issues that, that, that surround this. Uh, but, but one of them is, as you mentioned, that, that because people – they, well intended as they are, they just misuse the software, and before they know it, they've written a speech, and uh, that's just not the right way to engage an audience. Um, but you know, hey, you know, they they find they, here it is in Word, they copy and paste it into PowerPoint, connect it to a projector, it shows up. Hey, how cool is that? I'm ready. Let's go. <laughs> you know, they have no idea that that that, um, that that they're about to commit death by PowerPoint. All they were doing was just you know sort of following the lead of the software. Oh. Um, yeah. Before you know it, uh, everybody's falling asleep and texting their friends. I can't wait to get out of here. This guy's a loser. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, well, Rick, let's talk a little bit about. You, as somebody who you know has been on this path of teaching others how to create better you know presentation slide decks, mm-hmm. what are some of the things that you personally struggled with? Um, you know, are there still things, you know, pitfalls and traps that you fall into when you're creating your slides to you know present to an audience? Is there anything that you can share with us on, yeah. on this? Well, part, I, I struggle with the same thing that just about every str- everybody struggles with, and that is just too much creating too much you know when i give a presentation today if i don't if i don't really if i don't know it so well that i don't need any notes at all i mean that's the best if you know it well enough that you don't need any notes so you know the path that you're going to take you know the story you want to tell and you can just be yourself in front of your audience but if you if you if you aren't at that point yet then the whole question is how much help do you give yourself and um i i try to make the the simplest notes possible index card one word for each main idea because otherwise if i start writing down too much then i'm going to become imprisoned by my notes just like people become imprisoned by their by their slides that have too much text it's the same dynamic and i call it i call it universal axiom number 2 of powerpoint and that is that if you display complete sentences on screen, it is practically impossible to not read every bit of it word for word. And it's the same thing with with notes. Even if you're not not thinking about about the slides that are behind you, if your notes are too detailed, then you're going to find yourself doing this all the time. You know, hi, uh, thank you all for coming, ladies and gentlemen. You know, and all it might say is thank you for coming. You know, as if I can't say thank you to the audience, but it's there in front of me with too much. And, uh, okay, so today uh, we have a, um, a, a what? Oh, I forgot what it was. Oh, yeah, a big agenda. I mean, like I didn't know. I mean, if I just put too many words on my notes, it's the same thing. Yeah. So I struggle with this a lot to just try to keep my notes as clean as possible, just enough to help to so that I know what I – where I'm going next, what the next thing I want to say is, and uh, and if I know that, and if I can, you know, just use my notes, okay, oh yeah, that thing, okay, now I'm ready to talk about this next thing, you know, here we go, because engaging the audience is all about 
um, I call it being naked in, in front of my audience. I don't use um, a lectern anymore if I don't have to. I don't need a hollow piece of wood in between me and my audience. Lord knows there's enough barriers between us with slides and nerves and everything else. Yeah. So the more I can just be in front of my audience with um, without notes that imprison me, without a lectern, uh, just 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 you know good eye contact and a story to tell, then I'm going to be comfortable. Yeah, and I, you touched on a couple of things that I know have been thematically represented in in many of the conversations I've had with past guests, and that's the idea that you've got to prepare, you've got to put you know some level of preparation into this. There's varying degrees, you know, if it's something that's not incredibly high stakes, you don't need to spend hours and hours and hours on, but you know, you've got to at least have a thoughtful approach to to what it is that you're doing. And the presentation design doesn't start in PowerPoint. No, it should start as far away from PowerPoint as you could possibly yep. be. <laughs> Absolutely. You know, pen and paper or yep. whatever, yep. you know, your preferred methodology is to just outline and brainstorm and just think about where do you want to go? What's the story you want to tell? And then the PowerPoint slides will should represent you know what it is that you're going or where you're going where you want to take the audience and when you do that and you begin to think about what does the audience need what do i have that i can give them and you know what is is the unique thing that i bring to the table and how can i give you know of myself and my personality in a way that's natural yeah, there you go. my style there you go. not me trying to be somebody that you know i think is a quote unquote presenter or a speaker, or you know, whatever it is. No, yeah. it's really about just being a real human being and sharing your message, sharing your story, your insights, whatever. Yeah, no, that that's that, that's that's well said, Brian. You know, a colleague of mine is is working on a book right now, um, all about what you can learn from from TED, from TED presentations. You know, and they're they're like the gold standard. You know, but I have to just wonder if uh, you know if if, if if that's going to be, if that's going to serve people, because, uh, you know, I can just see a whole bunch of, of, of people doing it. And I've done it myself. I've watched really good TED Talks and thought, uh, hey, you know, that's a nice technique that he just used. I wonder if I should try it. You know, and I think about it for a second. Wait a minute. I'd end up looking like an idiot if I tried that. Yeah. Uh, you have to find what works for you. You have to be yourself. And again, it's just, it's often so difficult just to get out from under your slides in order to do that. Uh, you know, you, you, you bring up um, practice. Well, practicing with the software, I don't think you could ever do too much of that. You know, but, you know, sequencing it, you know, working with your wireless remote, all of that, that that's, that's gold to, you know, I just don't think that you can spend enough hours doing that. But practicing the actual delivery, that's a more interesting question because some people will do really well by rote and others will just get all hosed up and become stiff and mechanical. And uh, one of the things as a consultant is to try to identify that personality type, the person who, who would do better if they they know what they want to say, they practice with the software, but now, okay, let's go. Where's my audience? And others really do need to be in a room doing it over and over again with some of their friends watching and stuff. So it's not always the case that you want to practice the actual delivery, but the, but the, 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 the technology component, absolutely. Yeah. Perfect. Well, I, I just want to make one last comment and we'll move on um, to the next section of our, our discussion. And I think it's something that you really you had a keen observation on is that it's not a one size fits all thing. What works for me as, as a presenter may not work for you, Rick. Right. And being able to identify that and realize like, what's your natural strengths? Are you somebody that if you had a very regimented approach to how you gave a presentation and that gave you comfort and allowed you to be who you are? Mm -hmm. Perfect. I've seen a lot of people that have that very, um, you know, process oriented approach to what they're doing. And it's great. Mm -hmm. They they uncover so many wonderful nuggets of wisdom in the course of their presentation. Mm -hmm. And then I've seen where the people who they're not like that, but they try and wing it and it's a complete disaster. Mm -hmm. And on the flip side, I've seen people who are really good at just speaking, you know, from the heart off the cuff and have people sitting on the edges of their seats. And if they try to do something in a very, um, you know, 
programmatic manner, mm -hmm. it's, it's a complete disaster. That's right. So that's right. It's very important that you don't try and do just because you saw so and so do this, yeah. that you should emulate that. It's really think through like, how does that apply to you and what you bring to the table and what's unique about, you know, how you communicate. And I think that that's really key. Yeah. You know, and, and a lot of this comes back to the software. I don't want to blame PowerPoint for everything because it's just a stupid tool after all. But, yeah. but when you said that you really should start away from PowerPoint, that's true. I mean, the veritable cocktail napkin will just serve you so much better. Uh, it's just, it's just way too narrow of a box. I mean, you sit down in front of PowerPoint, what do you get? What's the default title bullet, bullet, bullet. bullet, bullet, bullet. So there you are. Hand on mouse, keyboard in front of you. Okay, quick, become brilliant. <laughs> it just it just doesn't work that way. And yeah. so, I mean, really just, uh, I think that the computer itself is a very poor place to start any sort of creative project. Uh, I'd, I'd want you to, 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 to get as far away from it as you could. I mean, smart people become creative when they can bounce ideas around. Creative people become brilliant when they scribble ideas. Ah, that's no good. Crinkle it up, throw it away, start over. I mean, now you've got your creative canal opened as wide as possible. But PowerPoint is just way too narrow of a box to to be thinking creatively, and it all, and and it then tends to make a lot, create a lot of sameness. You know, title bullet bullet bullet. Oh, let's go find that template, put it in here. Now everybody's just sort of doing it the same way. So you're so so you're right. I mean, any anything that you could do to find yourself in this process is great, and PowerPoint rarely helps you in in that effort. So so true. Well, Rick, let's shift focus a little bit. I know we, we've uncovered and unearthed some really great things. Um, I'm sure that those in the audience are, are probably taking some uh, notes on everything that we've been touching upon. But I want to ask some very specific pointed questions about the expertise that you've developed over the years. And the first thing is, is really this idea of what are the top three things that those in the audience right now that are listening or watching, if they want to get better tomorrow and start to put together a presentation that's going to be the next level beyond where they've been. What are three essential key things that you might share with them? Top three things. Jeez, Brian, you could have, could have told me ahead of time you were going to ask for this. <laughs> All right. So let's see. Well, uh, let, let's, let's stay inside the software for just a moment. Um, I, I, I call it the three-word challenge, and those people that have uh, attended my seminars have, have heard this before. Can you reduce every one of your bullet points to three words or fewer? Mm. Now, that, that might be really difficult. It's probably impossible. But uh, the reward is in the attempt, because when you try to do that, then you scrutinize your slides to a degree that you otherwise wouldn't. You know, you're looking at it, okay, well, let's see, those 10 words, what, what the hell are they even trying to say? Now, forget it. We can get rid of all these verbs. We can get rid of that. The second bullet, you know what? Why is this even here? Do we even need to, to have this up there at all? You're going to say it, right? Let's get rid of that one altogether. You know, and yeah. when you go on this process, before you know it, you've got a slide that is so honed and distilled that even if you do nothing else to it, now it's going to act like a much better backdrop for, for, for you to tell your story. But, you know, also those people that say that, that uh, they're not designers, they didn't graduate, you know, with a degree in the arts or anything like that, I, you know, I don't know how to design slides. Well, you know, really, who knows? Who knows what kind of instincts people have uh, towards slide design. Most slides afford them no opportunity whatsoever. So after the three-word challenge, when you're now down to a slide that has a whole lot of white space, you know, and that now you've got a canvas that you can really you know, sink your teeth into. Is there an evocative photo that I can make full slide and find some space on that photo to take these words and you know, these these few words now that used to be complete sentences, you know, now you've got a slide that's going to vibrate at a totally different frequency. So um, uh, this, this, this whole notion of, of text on a slide, how much to put on it, and why am I putting on it, these are things that everybody struggles with, especially in corporate America, in the yeah. world, in the corporations. But, but really, you know, every, everywhere, everywhere you go, that, that's one of the key issues. Uh, so that's well, one. Well, Rick, I'll say that is, that's so good. That is such great advice. Do I get I'll let you that? leave it at that one. <laughs> okay. 
Because seriously, I mean, if if you just took that one thing and you've got a presentation next week that you have yeah. to deliver and you start to scrutinize and you may not get it down to three words, but if you get it down to five words, yeah. if you, you, holy you cow, try. that's going to make a tremendous amount of difference versus an entire sentence or three sentences that you've currently got on your slide. That's right. But giving me cool. full credit for that's not enough. Give me give me one and a half because All right. it, it's not enough to just tell people that, that this is a tactic that you should do, the three-word challenge. It's a very good tactic. It's one of the most important ones I give off. But that's not quite enough because you have to understand why people get themselves into that predicament in the first place. And the leading cause, in my experience, the the, the single most important contributor to, to too much crap on a slide is because people are trying to create slides for dual purposes. They're creating slides so for the live presentation, and then they're going to print those slides and somehow distribute them to their audience as the as the handout. And Brian, that never works. That fails every single time. You just can't expect a slide to to perform these two really important functions. You've got to separate them. You have to think about the handout separately. And as soon as you do that, then you're going to be get better at both of them. And, they're, and, and, and both processes are going to be more rewarding. You can focus just on the slide as the visual component of the presentation. Then, okay, what's all the detail that I need to give my audience for later? And when you separate those two, you're going to be better at both of them, and your audiences are going to love you for it. Most people, most, most companies I go into, they don't do this. They just they, they, they create their slides, they give their presentation, they print their slides. And they should be separated. You know, a good presentation is made up of three things, what you say, what you show, and what you give. And those should be three separate things. All too often, though, they end up being the same thing because people write it all out, put it up on screen, recite it all, <laughs> and then print it. <laughs> so so there, there, there's the disconnect right there. No, well, I, I'm so glad that you said that, too, because it, it's a huge... It creates a fundamental shift in how you prepare That's your right. slides. That's right. It does. Yeah. And I, I've worked with sales teams before where you know they've been in that situation where we've worked with them to revamp and use things like the three word challenge to get it down to the essentials with great visuals and you know c- catchy copy, so to speak, with a headline or whatever it is. Mm-hmm. And they're like, "Well, this looks great." But there's a problem. We leave our slides yeah. with a prospect as like a takeaway mm-hmm. or a handout. And I said, no, mm-hmm. you're not going to do that any longer. Good there's a you. way that we can mm-hmm. deal with that. Yeah. But essentially, your slides are your slides. That's right. If you need to have a leave behind, we'll create a leave behind That's for you. And right. there's a couple different ways that we can do that. A, but a just get out of that slide. mind. Slide should necessarily fail as the handout. Mm-hmm. Oh, no. Cool. All right, Rick. Well, the last thing I have for you, and we'll take a quick break, um, is really I wanted to get to what are some of the actually, and we'll make it easy. I won't. I won't go crazy on you. We'll do one thing. What's like the biggest, most common struggle you see out there with all the folks that you teach? Um, you know, what's, what's one thing that you're just like, oh my gosh, I see this time and time again. Yeah. We, we, we've heard too much text on a slide. So, so let me give you another, one. so maybe not number one, but the thing that, that perhaps is, uh, is the least stood and that is uh, time management, uh, in the moment, giving a presentation, people become imprisoned by their slide deck to the point that you know they don't even want to take questions because oh, geez, I only have ten minutes left and I know I got fifteen slides left and right. if I take questions who knows you know but of course Q and A is like the best thing you could possibly do in a presentation to actually create you know connectedness with your audience you're asking them a question that you're finding back and you're going to speak directly to it. The last thing you want to do is, is you know cut off Q and A or heaven forbid wait until the end. Right. But people you know. We're all very linear. We lead our lives in a very linear way. We create our slides that way. PowerPoint is designed by default to go from slide one, two, three, et cetera. But there's a whole bunch of techniques that you don't learn <laughs> in the first hour of training that can allow you to work through a slide deck in a non-linear way. You, know, you can create a hyperlink 
uh, on slides, just like you do at websites. And so um, you take a question and you ask, a, you, you give a really good answer. And you allow that to you indulge that for five or ten minutes. And, you know, you look at your clock. Oh, I got five minutes left. Click one little button. And now you're you're you jumped 15 slides. You're at your closing. You can close strongly. Nobody has to know that you just just jumped over a whole section. Yep. And uh, and and people people. People don't know this because they, you know, they they're at the tip of the iceberg with PowerPoint. It's not that difficult to do to create hyperlinks and triggers and things like that. And um, so, you know, without getting geeky on you, that one technique in PowerPoint can can just deliver people from that feeling of being so confined in that linear. And uh, okay, I gotta get through these slides and get to the end. Phew, yep. I made it. Okay, thank you. I gotta go now. <laughs> <laughs> Cool. Well, that's great. Rick, we're going to take a quick break, but we'll be right back for our rapid fire Q&A portion. All right. Are you looking for a proven system to help prepare focused, crystal clear talks that you deliver with confidence and power? Look no further than the SCORE Conference, hosted by my friends Michael Hyatt and Ken Davis. Several past guests like Jeff Goins, Kerry Wilkerson, Paul Evans, and others have all attended this event. I've personally experienced this training and use it every single day. It's the only program that goes beyond just overcoming fear or tackling delivery techniques. I'm not exaggerating when I say this stuff will change your life. The next training is in Orlando the first week of May, and I've got something sweet for you. $200 off your registration if you use the discount code SPEAK right now. That's S-P-E-A-K. You'll also be automatically entered into a drawing to have your entire registration fee waived. How cool is that? The winner will be selected April 28th. Just go to whatthespeak.com slash score and don't forget the discount code SPEAK. So Rick, real quick, we're going to go through about a half dozen questions. The first thing that comes to your mind and the first question I have is, are you a slide guy or a no slide kind of guy? So I think I know the answer, but why is it, do you have this love and this passion for slides? I'm a slide guy because I work in corporate where 99% of all presentations are given with PowerPoint. So I'm a slide guy, but I, I want to be imprisoned to them. And I always insist that, in fact, I ask my clients, and you said it earlier, Brian, if the projector blew up, could you still give your talk? You have to be able to answer yes to that question before you declare yourself ready to go on. So um, if, if, if we eliminated PowerPoint from the world, uh, uh, the world might be a better place, but that's never going to happen. Uh, we live in a slide world, and so I have to call myself a slide guy. Yeah. Well, this is some. Uh, this is a, a a little fact that I've quoted, and, and those in the audience may have heard me say this before. I was reading um, some research where uh, some folks had estimated that two hundred and fifty million dollars is lost and wasted every single day because of poor presentations, poor slides. Oh, boy, crazy. <laughs> All right, so. For for those who are, are speakers and presenters, um, is there anybody in particular that inspires you and, and maybe along the years that you've been kind of out speaking on this very topic? Um, who's somebody that inspires you and, and why? Oh, Lord. Well, um, I mean, our, our industry has its rock stars. Um, uh, probably chief among them is Nancy Duarte, yeah. uh, who, um, you know, she, she's like um, uh, this, the the... the the slide designer to the stars uh, here in Silicon Valley. And just about everybody knows Gar Reynolds also, um, mm-hmm. uh, who lives in Japan. Uh, he'll, he'll speak at the conference virtually. Uh, our 8.30 uh, keynote address, uh, we'll find him uh, in, his, uh, in, in, in his sweats, uh, practically his PJs at 1 o'clock in the morning, uh, Osaka time. Yeah. Uh, he, he's, he's terrific. Um, I mean, I, uh, not, not, not to be a shill for the conference, but I could just... Mm-hmm. Go through the list of uh, our presenters and uh, and point to many heroes uh, in that group. Julie Turber, uh, most uh, talented designers that I know, and she has chosen uh, chosen presentation as her medium for that. Uh, Rick Bretschneider was spent seventeen years, uh, I think it was seventeen years, as the as the head of uh, PowerPoint development for Microsoft. Uh, recently retired from that position, uh, still active in the industry, comes to the conference every single year. 
um, uh, there, there are there are lots of people that I could call heroes uh, just in the presentation industry. Love it. All right. Well, as somebody who's given a lot of presentations, what's like the craziest, most bizarre or funny, interesting story that you can share with us? Is something just gone awry? Something that's gone awry? Well, gosh, um, we just saw this. I mean, who just had his 15 minutes of fame? Help me out here. The the, the movie producer who... Uh, oh, uh, Michael Bay. Yes, yes. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, 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 I felt mostly sympathy for the guy. Yeah. Um, uh, cause you know, he just, uh, you know, for, for those of your audience that don't know, he was asked to, um, uh, to come on stage and, and it was, it was a product pitch of some sort, the teleprompter. Yeah, was it CES at the right. consumer was, electronics yes. show? Yeah. yeah. And the, and the teleprompter went out and he got a bozoed out. He just, he just do. And everybody thought, well, I mean, come on, this guy worked in Hollywood. He should be wing it. But the fact yeah. is he spends most of his time behind the camera not mm-hmm. in front of it and so he had his his moment you know this deer in the headlights where he was he, he didn't he, he he knew what he wanted to say but he was in prison to his teleprompter and when it yeah. went out that was it oh my gosh. now yeah, the other bad. hand uh, i remember that talk of a, of a neurosurgeon a woman who was sharing with her audience um, her experience having a stroke and and being being aware of it happening, and she started the whole talk by having a human brain brought out uh, in, in, uh, in on the stage, put her gloves on, picked it up, explained the hemispheres and everything. Talk about a prop, you know? Yeah. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Uh, it's crazy. Well, cool. Um, let's talk a little bit about your ability to speak and share your passion. What's the impact been on on your career, your business, and the things that you do um, by being able to to master or at least commit to mastering these skills? Well, you know that if you can communicate effectively, that's going to help your employability. If you know how to write, there's going to be a job for you. If you know how to speak, so much the better because so many people are scared to do it. Yeah. If, you, if you can find yourself, I go back to that quote from Larry Bird uh, who said, give me the ball. 30 seconds left, we're down by two, give me the ball. If you can be the give me the ball person at your organization and doing something that, that most people don't want to do and not only are you willing to do it but you are going to but you 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 want not to do it to thrive in that environment uh, omg you know i mean that's yeah. there's people that can help you around like that love it well rick we are at the end of our discussion time i thank you so I much do. again for coming on the show it was brilliant to have you on here i'm sure we could probably have you come back on again and we can go through even more specifics on presentation That design. would be my pleasure, Brian. Cool. Thank you. So we'll have um, links in the show notes over at whatthespeak.com to your website, the conference, the um, presentation summit. We'll also probably link to uh, the videos that you mentioned and some of the other resources. And again, thank you so much, sir. I uh, loved having you on the show. You are truly somebody that kicks ass when they speak, present, or pitch. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Today's guests certainly had some amazing insights they shared. If you'd like to purchase a copy of their latest book, visit this episode's show notes over at whatthespeak.com and click the link at the bottom of the page to immediately order their book. All right, here we go with the outro. Thanks so much for joining us today on What The Speak. Be sure to visit whatthespeak.com for show notes on every episode and to sign up for our email list to stay updated on resources that'll help you kick ass when you speak, present, or pitch. 